deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no Thank you, Miss Amanda, and uh, I certainly am glad that his wounds did pay our ransom. It's a beautiful song. Uh, we have with us this morning uh, Brother Skip uh, Tilton. His lovely wife, Jennifer, is in the back, and uh, this is Miss Anna Lou Jett's daughter, and uh, if you did not know that, but uh, we had an excellent message in Sunday school this morning on fossils and uh, looking at those things, and, uh, and I think we'll all remember that it takes the right conditions and uh, to make a fossil in that and the word of God is always true and they certainly proved that this morning this morning he's going to be bringing a message on uh, our worldview so let's get our Bibles out and uh, be ready for what God has for us through brother Tilton I think we'll pause Talk about what you just sang. I'm going to take a rabbit trail. We come to church to meet as a family. We don't become here because this is a nice building. We don't come here because of any of the physical properties that exist here in this facility. We gather together as Christians because of what she just sang about. That's why we're here. That's why we're a family. 
Okay? And too often, as I've traveled, I've been in churches where they've lost that. That church is just a routine. And it's just something that I do. There's a mindset in the minds of some people that because I came to church, God will bless me. That's works. It's not by works of righteousness that we have done. It's according to his mercy that he saved us. We are so wretched before a holy, righteous God. Oh, and he went to the cross for you and me. And we are so undeserving. We're going to go to an area of Scripture that lays that foundation. We're going to go to Genesis this morning. And I want to preach a message to you the Lord laid on my heart a month ago or two months ago that I've been working through. And this is for you if you're here this morning and you're a Christian. We have an area, an element in our Christianity that I find isn't happening between you, the believer, and the people that God has preordained to get in front of you, your neighbor, your co-worker, your spouse, your children, your in-laws. And there's a question. There's actually three of them you're going to see. The title of this message is the the three big questions. And I want to challenge you with regards to those. And how they integrate into your day-to-day life. And my hope is, is that after this message, that you would have the volitional ability within you to answer somebody, why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? What would you say to somebody who asked you that question? And that's very important because you are, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you and you are a lighthouse in a world that is dark. And there are people, the Bible tells us, sanctify the Lord God where? In your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And you notice it says, be ready always to give an answer. And I thank God that my pastor, Marshall Fant IV, about four months ago, uh, he became our full-time pastor. His dad retired in our church, and we called his son to be our pastor. And he started right out of the gate with a series of messages And this was involved in one of the messages. And I said, man, that's good. That message needs to get out. And I'm incorporating it into what I do. He didn't do it in this method I'm going to do today. But it's still the same theme. Be ready always to do what? To give an answer. Sure, we talk about fossils. Tonight we're going to talk about the post-flood world. I talk about biology and chemistry and astronomy and all sorts of things. All of those things are answers. But the most important one is right here of the reason of the hope that is in you. What's that reason? I hope the message this morning will help fill that in. The three big questions. I don't know where I first heard these questions. I heard them somewhere in my journey. But I have come to believe that it's true. That every person on the face of the earth, these three questions are in their heart of hearts. I learned this in in stronger detail when I went over to the Philippines this year. Because here I was across the world in a whole, I had never been overseas. I had never flown for 28 hours before. I had never been out in the middle of nowhere where it was so different, yet we could still speak English, amen. That would have been really frightening if I couldn't talk to them. But we found that people are people, no matter where they are in the world, and all of them seem to have these three questions. And what we're going to be doing is we're coming back to examining your worldview. Because those questions reside in your worldview. Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I submit to you that there's these three questions. The first one is, where did I come from? Where did I come from? I'm here. 
right? Remember that when you were a kid? You got to that point. Well, here I am. Yeah. Where did I come from? Okay. I, well, I don't know. Oh, I came from mom. Well, we know that, but we know the bigger question. Where, where, where did we come from? The second one is, why am I here? Why am I here? I recently was counseling a man about this, and this was the question, at, and he's not a teenager. This was the question he was struggling with. Why am I here? And the third one, where am I going to go when I die? Amen? How many of you have had these three questions? All of us. And they're so important. So let's look at it. Where did I come from? When someone comes up to me and asks me, why am I a Christian? By God's grace for the rest of my life, this is how I'm going to answer it. Till I can find something better. Amen? Because I'm going to start with this. Why am I a Christian? Well, it's actually not because of the Bible directly, in a sense. It's actually because of someone in the Bible. I'm a Christian because of somebody named Jesus. Because I learned about somebody named Jesus, and this person was a real person who really lived many years ago. And he lived in unlike any other person in the world without sin. And he lived and he died and he was buried and he's resurrected and it was witnessed by thousands of people and it's a real event that happened in the history of the world and it affects you and me today and forever. Why am I a Christian? Because of Jesus. How did I learn about Jesus? That's how I get to the Bible. I first heard about Jesus, not from the Bible. I first heard about Jesus because of Christmas. Because our country celebrates Christmas and our country celebrates Easter. That's how I heard about the idea of who Jesus is and heard parts about his life, okay? But I didn't have the whole picture, but I had knowledge of the name Jesus, okay? Because I didn't become a, a Christian until I was 22 in Goose Creek, South Carolina, serving the United States Navy. But growing up, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. So I learned about Jesus, and I learned about his life, right? And I learned about his death, and then I learned about his resurrection. So when someone asks me, why am I a Christian? Why do you have hope? Why are you happy? And I've had people ask me that. You are just so enthusiastic, and you're bubbly, and you talk a lot, and you're an extrovert. Why? Because of Jesus. I mean it. How is it that I can get up here and do what I do? It's because of Jesus. This is what he called me to do. This is what he gifted me to do. I've just spent the last two weeks helping my wonderful mother-in-law move out of her house. And I've learned crystal clear what God has gifted her to do for the last 40-some years because it saturates what she owns. I mean it. Her love for children, her love for teaching, undeniable gift from God. God's given you a gift too, and you need to find out what it is, and you need to jump right in. Amen? And don't be afraid. Just jump in and watch God work in your life. I know about Jesus because I just became obedient to the call when he called me. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll go preach. He said, okay. And he led the way. And by his grace, I keep following him. But why am I a Christian? Because of Jesus. His death, his life, and his resurrection. And how do I know about that Jesus? I know about that Jesus because of the Bible. 
preaching in New York City, in uh, Brooklyn, in a private school in their library. We had about 25 people visiting that day at this little church plant, and I preached a message, and I got done. When I got done, one of the finest dressed guys I've ever seen is sitting off to my right. And I said, okay, does anybody have any questions? His hands went right up. I said, yes, sir. He said, that Bible. How do you know the Bible is true? Great question. How would you answer that? I'm going to help you. Why? Because it's a part of answering these three questions. I believe in Jesus, and I believe in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is a miraculously preserved text that I can read in my language. And it's miraculous, folks. There's no other piece of literature in the world like the living Word of God. Okay? How we got it, it's absolutely amazing. And yet, most of us, we don't even stop for a minute to think about how we got it. And yet, it's an integral part of telling somebody about Jesus. How did we get the canon? When you begin to understand about the Word of God, when you begin to understand how we got the canon, it begins to open up the miraculous list of the event that God has saved you and that he's created you. John MacArthur, in our Sunday school study at our church, said this in the little book we were using. As we go through the 12 studies in this book, we'll discover that the Bible is not so much the history of mankind as the history of life. That is God, his love and grace towards mankind. That's what the Bible taught me and continues to teach me. Because unfortunately, I'm just like you. I'm still a sinner saved by grace. Amen? And sometimes we sin. I'm so glad that he loves me. I'm so glad that I can trust his word. And you see, his word starts in a place called that. You know what that is? That's a Greek word. And that's the Greek word for Genesis. Genesis is the beginning. Okay? Genesis is the origin. It's the origin of my understanding of who God is. And when I have the canon in front of me, when I have the Bible in front of me, God has given it to us in a specific order. I remember as a young person, not a believer yet, I was very interested in the book of Revelation. Starting back here, amen? Rule number one, new believer, not a believer yet, don't start in the book of Revelation. Why? Because you can't read the back of the book until you've read through the book. Amen? Because there's so much that is built and set in place before you get to Revelation to be able to understand it. What about this horse? And what about that judgment? And oh no, I can't understand God. He's foreign to me. But if you'll just go to the other side, turn the book over, and start right here... He, through the process of preservation, by inspiration, has given us the text of what he wants us to know in a way that is very simple and easy to understand. I do not need a PhD. I don't even need a HS diploma. Amen? I just need to know the basics of English, if that's the language I'm reading, to understand what God did. And I can read it, and I can get it. And so I will tell people, I believe in Jesus. And the reason I believe in Jesus is because of his word. And since I, if I have a copy of the word of God with me, let's open his word right in the beginning and learn about who he is. Some of you are saying, wait a minute, Jesus is only in the New Testament. Oh, no, he isn't. He starts right there in Genesis 1.1. It's the origin. And so the history of the Word of God and the origin of the Word of God, I have the Word of God. And that man asked that question at that meeting. How do I know the Bible is the Word of God? 
I said, because the Bible talks about it. Especially in Genesis, by the Bible covers a lot of teaching in Genesis. It talks about the creation of the world, Adam and Eve, the fall of man, Cain and Abel, the first murder, Noah and the ark, the great flood, the first covenant, the sons of Noah, heritage and family, the Tower of Babel, the history of Israel. All of this is found in the first 12 chapters of the book of the Bible. And the amazing thing is, is that it was written in the 6th century B.C., the Old Testament, okay? When Jesus was alive, what did they have? They had what? The Old Testament. They didn't have any of the New Testament. So when you hear Jesus and the apostles talking about the Old Testament, that's extremely important. Why? Because it authenticates their belief in the accuracy of what those books teach. Okay? It authenticates the accuracy of what the Old Testament is saying when it's quoted in the New Testament. The New Testament is written in the first century AD. And Genesis, generally agreed, is written by Moses. Okay? And so here in Mark 10 3, Jesus answered and said unto them, What did who? Moses command you, meaning what? He believed in the authenticity and the, in the historicity and the accuracy of Genesis and the Old Testament. Here's another one. Luke 24, 27. And beginning with what? Moses and all the prophets on the road to Emmaus. He interpreted them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. Jesus teaching these men, they don't have the New Testament, he's teaching them what? Of all the things concerning himself in the Old Testament. Wow. John 1, 17, for the law was given by who? Moses. What's the law? The first five books of the Bible. Okay? Again, the accuracy, the integrity of the text. John 5, 46, 47. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Again, the same thing. And Luke 16, 31. And he said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, now we're talking about an expanded component of the Old Testament, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now that's a startling statement. Who rose from the dead? Our Jesus And if they don't believe the Old Testament, neither are they going to believe if one rose from the dead. Wow. If they're not going to believe in the real history of the world, they're not going to be persuaded even though one rose from the dead. See how powerful this is? It's extremely powerful. And it's extremely practical. And it's extremely relevant to you and me. Genesis was written after by Moses after the Exodus in 1445 B.C. and before Moses died in 1405. Somewhere in there, that's where I get my text. That's where the text starts. The New Testament was written in the first century A.D. after Christ died, 1,400 years later. Genesis covers more time in history than all the remaining books of the Bible. (laughs) How about that? That's a lot of history. History of the world. You know what's neat about today? Science. Science today allows archaeologists to discover more things. And now they have satellites that are combing the earth. They fly over the Amazon and they're finding whole civilizations. They're finding stuff under the desert in Egypt and all across the northern sections of Africa. Why? Because it doesn't take very long for things to change. It just takes what? The right conditions. And the earth is constantly changing. And the more they dig up, the more they start realizing, hey, there's this book over there that talked about that city, that talked about that guy who's inscribed on that stone. And that's what it should be if this is the history of the world. And the more and more they discover, the more and more they understand the accuracy of the authority of the Word of God. And so, every New Testament author quotes or alludes to Genesis. There's over 103 references. Why is that important? Because they're talking about its authenticity and its history and its reliability. Would you like to see them all? I'm going to show them to you. You ready? Here we go. 
all of these places, they're talking about the Old Testament and how accurate it is. And the ones with the little parentheses specifically are in the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis. Isn't that amazing? And they're quoting it because it's an authority and because it can be trusted. And you can trust it too. That's the point. Overwhelmingly, it's presumed to be an actual, historical, and accurate document. So I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus. And I believe what the Bible has to say about Jesus, which comes down to it's all about the authority of the Bible. I can trust it. I can trust it. One of the struggles we have in the Christian life today that you have and that I have is this. We let non-authoritative things get in the way of us reading the authoritative thing. Amen? A friend of mine said it this way in the Philippines. He said, we spend too much time on Facebook instead of having our face in the book. Amen? <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's also very condemning because it's true. As a young person in America today, you're taught of the God of sports. You're taught the God of entertainment. You're not taught about the God of history. And you're going to learn in America especially how to spend your time with those things that culture says is important and you're going to neglect the very thing that is extremely important. And that's the battle. And it comes back to our understanding, Jesus and the Bible. That's what motivates me, folks. That's what my wife and I work hard on this. We turned some things off in our house. Yes, we did. And she could tell you, and I'll tell you, I'm glad we did. Because we're recognizing how to prioritize our time. Because time is the only thing that God has given me in which I have an opportunity to prepare to meet him. And you're going to meet him. Yes, you are. My life verse is found, two verses are found in the last two verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, which say this. And by the way, I memorize these because I need it. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. So I decided to memorize that. So it would help keep me in line so that I will keep doing good because I'm going to stand before God someday and so are you and so is every single human being on the face of this planet. Now, rabbit trail. My mother-in-law was accosted by some wicked people just a few weeks ago. And in my flesh, oh, I can get pretty angry. But you know what I know? That book is true. That book is real. And that book tells me that those people that I'm probably never going to meet on this side of the earth are going to stand before a holy, righteous God for the wicked things they did to my mother-in-law. Nobody gets away with anything. See the importance of understanding the authority of the Word of God? It will change how you live. It will change your motivations. But not only should it scare you and have a fear of God, but you should rejoice in the song she just sang because of a great salvation that we have. We don't deserve it, and he did it. Wow. Wow. I'll say it backwards. Wow! I've learned in my life there's only one thing that is awesome, and that is God Almighty. He is awesome. He's awesome. 
He holds the very molecules of your body together. All over 100 trillion cells in your body, you create over a million new ones every second, and he keeps it all there. People talk about, I want to live in a big house, and I want to live in this. Let me tell you, God says there's a house coming in the city of Jerusalem in the future that is 1,600 miles square. 1,600 miles high. (laughs) That's my God's house, amen? And he loves me so much and I don't deserve it that I'm going to get a chance to go there. (laughs) Wow. And how do I know all this? It is written. See that? It's written. It's all about the authority of the word of God. This is just the introduction, brother. Amen? Amen. What are we taught about the history of the world today? We're taught evolution, right? We're not taught anything about the Word of God. We're taught all this false dogma. And what is your worldview? Is your worldview and how you live coming out of here, or is it influenced by the world that's out there? And that is the battle of the mind. That's where we struggle today. That's where you and me, the rubber hits the road, where we have to fight. We have to be disciplined. We have to learn how to live godly. Her song talked about Christ being a light that lives through his people and how grateful the songwriter was for that happening. You know how you live like a Christian? You live according to God's word. As God's word is in you, it works through you, and people see a reflection of him in you. That's what it is. That's what it is. What is your worldview? It's how you interpret the world that you live in. There's a secular world out, worldview out there that believes in millions of years, doesn't believe in the authority of the Word of God. That's why that man raised his hand and asked me not just that question, he asked me four or five in a row. When we got done, shook hands with the people that came, this man came up to me, and his hand is shaking like that. The pastor of the church and I are standing there. He hands me his card. That man was a Supreme Court judge in New York State, affected by the word of God. He said, thank you very much. I needed to understand these things. And I handed them over to the pastor. I don't know what happened since then, but it's the authority of the word of God at work in this man's life. Why? Because all he believed in was a secular worldview. Philosophically, secular humanists are naturalists. That is, they believe that nature is all that exists. The material world is all that exists. There's no God, no spiritual dimension, no afterlife. Cosmos, Carl Sagan, author of the Cosmos series, he said the universe is all that there is or ever was or ever will be. Hey, let me tell you something. Carl Sagan understands the truth now because he's dead. And how sad to stand before the living God knowing that you spent your life trying to teach people contrary to his word. And that's what he did. My dad loved Carl Sagan. He would make my sister and I sit down and watch Cosmos when it came on on Sunday when I was a little kid. How sad. But that's what naturalists are. Secular humanism then can be defined as a religious worldview. It's based on atheism or naturalism, evolution, and ethical relativism. That's what it is in in the the detail of it. And basically, it's man determines truth for himself. How? Apart from God's word. And when you sin, you know what happens? You determine truth for yourself apart from God's word. That's what happens. That's why if you have the Holy Spirit, you get under conviction. And praise God when you come under conviction. You know why? Because that means God still loves you and you're recognizing it even though you're rebelling against it. Because if he didn't love you, he wouldn't let you get under conviction. He let you, some people that happens, he lets them go their merry way. Matter of fact, some believers were kicked out of the church for what? The destruction of the body for the saving of their soul. Sin's a terrible thing, but when it happens, 
It primarily happens because man is making a choice, determining truth for himself apart from the word of God. What are they taught? There was a big bang, right? Yeah, billions of years ago, there was a big bang. No one knows how, no one knows exactly where, or when. Boom, material blew up. Inorganic material became organic. They want to say that the earth was a big asteroid and somehow it just happened to land at the right distance from the sun and just happened to get in the right rotation of an exact circle around the sun and the right distance and oh, a miraculous atmosphere appeared on the ball of fire. Oh, and all this water got there. Oh, the moon. Man, now that's a miracle too because that hit the earth and bounced off the earth and it started rotating around the earth and oh, that's how this all got here. There's a Greek word for that. Remember what it is? I told you last time I was here. Hoggy washioso. Hogwash. All of that is impossible. And yet they teach these kind of things over and over again as if they're truth. Somewhere, somehow, no one knows exactly where, no one knows exactly when. There was that blob, right? Here it is, inorganic material. And then it became organic until you have a man up here. And that's how it's taught. And I shared with this the last hour, those fossils and all those rock layers, where it, it points to millions of years. Look at all that death, disease, and pain, and suffering. And so they continue to teach it that way. This Hollywood actor, Bruce Willis, posted this in the Cincinnati Enquirer when I lived there. It's really interesting because a lot of people think this way. They organized religion, used to hang the whole thing on one hook. If you don't do these things, if you don't act morally, you're going to burn in hell. Unfortunately, with what we know about science, anyone who thinks at all probably doesn't believe in fire and brimstone anymore. So organized religion has lost that voice to hold up their moral hand. Yeah, that's how they think. The natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. It's one of the marvelous things about becoming a Christian a miraculous event takes place. Not just your salvation, but God imparts a part of him into you. And now you have the ability to grow and discern what? This, the word of God. Poor Bruce, he doesn't realize it. He's been led astray. And a lot of people, they don't understand science at all. Evolution is basically saying science has proven you can't trust the Bible. There's two primary areas that this deals with, operational science and historical science. Operational science is science that happens in the present. It's repeatable. It's observable. It's how we make computers and glasses and cars and airplanes, pews for you to sit on. We generate electricity. We don't even know what it is. We just know how to harness it. Okay? That's what operational science has done. But historical science is the study of what has happened in the past. And when it happened in the past, wasn't seen by anybody in the present. Happened one time, like the Grand Canyon. All right? Now watch the screen. Both creation and evolution are stories about the past. I can't prove to you which one is true using historical science. That's impossible. But what I can do is I can use operational science in the present, I can look at the world that I live in, and I can see which one of those two stories about the past makes the most sense. Amen? And that's what we do. Because you still have to trust by faith. Isn't that interesting? Faith. It's going to take faith. Either way. We all have the same facts. I shared that the last hour. Oh, I put it away. We all have the same facts. We all have the same fossils. All facts are interpreted, yes. And all facts are interpreted based upon what? A presupposition. And the presupposition is going to drive the investigation of the evidence into the interpretation. And in my life, prior to becoming a Christian, I believed in secular humanism. Now I believe the Bible, and the Bible is my uh, bias that I have in my mind and the filter from which I use to look at the world I live in. Amen? That's how we learn how to think biblically. 
We use the word of God. We apply it to the world that we live in. So we interpret the world that we live in, and we build our worldview. Now, there's a lady in here who asked me a question out in the lobby. I don't know where she is, but ma'am, this next slide is the quote I wanted to tell you about. This is Dr. Richard Lewontin, professor of genetics at Harvard University. He knows what he's talking about. Listen to what he has to say regarding a bias in science against a creator. We take the side of evolutionary science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated, just-so stories. When I grew up, those were called lies. And when I lied, I got the rod of correction upon the seat of my understanding. Amen? What is he saying? We put up with lying. We put up with all these things. Why? Because we have a priori commitment, a commitment to materialism, Molecules to man evolution. Now watch the screen. I want you to see what a priori means. A priori means in a way based on theoretical deduction rather than empirical observation. You get that? Where's their bias? Their bias is in how they think, and they're not interested in what empirical observation operational science in the present is saying. We are going to believe evolution, molecules to man, materialism. Why? Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And you wonder why our country is going backwards? in the educational institutions that we support publicly? This is why. Because there's a bias. A bias against the truth. Because what's the alternative, Dr. Lewontin? Accountability. Because when God's the authority, there's accountability. If there is no God, there's no accountability. Do what you want. Kill the cat. Kill the kid. What's the difference? We're all just a bunch of natural cells out here. It's survival of the fittest. Right? And that's why so many of these people have been deceived. And they come into my mother-in-law's house and they hit her with their weapons and they shot their weapons off inside her house. Why? Because they don't understand how they've been lied to. Maybe some of them understand it and they've chosen against God. Because people do that too. They don't want to be held accountable to God. They become their own source of knowledge. They determine truths for themselves. And that's what this is all about. The results of the attack of the biblical book of Genesis, some people think it's a side issue. They don't think it's important. I don't need to worry about Genesis. I need to go out there and tell people about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus loves them. Why? Why? Why does Jesus love man? The only way you're going to get that answer is to do what? you got to go back to the beginning. you got to understand what happened in the beginning. And if you don't understand what happened in the beginning, you're going to be telling people you need to be saved, and they're not going to understand anything you're saying to them because they don't have a historical context for it. See that? They don't know. So we need to point them back to Genesis. Back to the worldview that the scripture gives us. And that's what I try to do. Why? Because the Bible is the history book of the universe. And it can be trusted in everything it touches upon. And so what do we do? Well, I'm going to show you very quickly. You ready? This is going to be very fast. But I'll take the Bible. And I'll start where? In the first verse. In the beginning, God. Why? I'm laying that history. God did what? He created. What did he create? The heaven and the earth. 
That's where it came from. Where did I come from? And earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke, and it came into existence. You realize later on, if you're a believer, if you start reading in the book of Revelation, when he comes back to make war, he doesn't have guns. He doesn't have tanks. He doesn't have nuclear weapons. He's sitting on a horse. And all he does is speak. (gasps) That's frightening. It's also wonderful. Because he's God. And he's all powerful. And he's omniscient. And he loves me. And some of us are going to be riding on the white horses behind him. As he comes in great power and great glory. But in the beginning, he spoke and it happened. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, wa- uh, excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who's that? Jesus. Where I started, amen? He was in the beginning with God. He's there at the creation. John 1, 3. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. This Jesus, who resurrected, only one in history, nobody, by the way, ever doubted it and said it didn't happen, and they had thousands of years to say, oh, that didn't happen, it's a lie. No one has ever said it's a lie and that it didn't happen. That Man, Jesus, who was also God, is here in the beginning. And he made the earth. He made everything. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. He created light. God saw the light, the good and divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness. He called night, evening, and morning were the first day. God gave us times and seasons. Day one, space, earth, and time. Day two, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. I won't read that. He made the firmament in the heaven. Amen? (laughs) Stay for time. Day two. Then what? Day three, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. He brought dry land together and saw that it was good. He made everything after its kind. When I was in the Philippines, I used this very simple phrase right here to teach kids. I spoke to 400 and 500 at a time in their public schools. And I would talk to them about kinds, and I would say, what's a kind? You know what a kind is? Well, I'll teach you very quickly. You ever seen a cat give birth to a dog? No. You ever seen a dog give birth to a cow? No. You ever see a dog give birth to a horse? No. Why? Because things that are after their kind only reproduce after their kind. Dogs have dogs. Cats have cats. Amen? I mean, have you ever seen a cow have a chicken? No. I've seen cows tell me to eat chicken on the side of the road, a Chick-fil-A. But consider, he made everything. This is day three. He's talking about plants here. Have you ever seen an apple tree produce watermelons? No. Have you ever seen a corn stalk produce onions? No. Why? Because everything reproduces after its... Kind. It takes the right conditions for things to grow. And God has made everything after its kind. And today I see the evidence of this event that happened in the history of the world portrayed in front of me every day. Remember, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds. People don't realize what's happening around them. God created the dry land and vegetation. Then what? Day four, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. He creates the sun and the moon. He put them up there so that man would understand it's time for seasons and planting. And that's been happening ever since the creation. We still have countries today that use the moon and the quarters, the first quarter, second quarter, third, full, right? Why? As a, as a mechanism for understanding time. He creates the sun and the moon and the stars. And then on day five... He creates the land animals. How? After their kind. And notice, he, God blessed them 
First time God said something about blessing, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. And so they did. And so now he's created everything on day five, and now we have day six. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. He creates all the land animals ten times after their kind, living creatures that can produce offspring regardless of how they look. That's important. We have people today trying to tell some groups of people, you're not human. Really? They're human. They didn't come from apes because they reproduce after their kind. God said, let us, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Genesis where? One. What verse? 26. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Where did I come from? Right there. Let him have dominion over the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Why am I here to take dominion in this earth? That's why you're here. Where did I come from? I came from God. Why am I here? Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. You came from God. Have dominion. And what did he tell them? Notice there in the middle of that verse, replenish the earth, okay? Multiply what? Fill it. Subdue it. Have dominion over all these things. That's why you're here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he, him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and fill the earth. So that's our job. And then God said, see, I've given you every herb upon the field and every green herb. Everything was a vegetarian. Amen, he said. <laughs> hey, I like steak, brother. Amen. I can eat steak today. Why? Because Leviticus, this, uh, the prohibition against eating meat was lifted. Hallelujah. I can have bacon. Amen. But I get that from the word of God. So in the beginning, God created everything a certain way. Why am I here? You're here because God created you and he wants you to fill the earth. And he wants you to have a relationship with him. And the heavens were finished and on the seventh day God ended his work. And by the way, I didn't stop to, to really detail it, but I want you to consider something. God spoke all the other animals into existence, right? He did. God spoke all the plants into existence, right? He did. How was man created? God came down and sculpted the ground and passionately he breathed into man the breath of life. Ooh. Human beings are special. We're special because of the real history of the world. What I see in God's world agrees with what I read in God's word today. Colossians, for by him were all things created. The, everything in the whole heaven and earth is created by him and for him. And notice, we jump over, and, oh, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and it said to the woman, yea, hath God said, he challenged the authority of the word of God. Hey, Eve, hath God said, the same attack is happening today. It's an attack upon the authority of God's word. See the relationship? And so what's happened? Well, Eve bought the lie. She determined truth for herself, and so she ate of it. And the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made aprons. Now think about that. It's just Adam and Eve in the whole world, okay? You put blinds on your house, I hope, you know, so people don't see your nakedness, right? There's no other people in the world. And they knew they were naked before a holy, righteous God. You know why we wear clothes? Because God is holy, and you're created in his image and in his likeness. That's why we wear clothes. It's the foundation of it right here. And I will put enmity, a separation between thee and the woman. He's talking to Satan. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Hey, buddy, somebody's coming, and he's going to crush your head. Who's that? Jesus. Amen. Here's my Savior. Not only is he creator, not only is he there, he's foretold as the one who's coming right here in Genesis 3.15. And so, 
Adam, uh, because you've hearkened to your wife and you've eaten of the tree which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now we struggle today in farming because of this curse. In sorrow, you're going to eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, they spring up today. It wasn't that way in the original creation. It's a judgment of God, so we struggle in our nurturing and our dominion over the earth today. Whoa, boy, this thing's touchy. Unto Adam and also to his wife, make the Lord God make coats of skin, and he clothed them. I don't know what kind of animal he killed, but I'm not going to be a bit surprised if I find out it's a lamb. A picture of what is to come in Jesus Christ, the Bible says the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world as a covering for our sin. Oh, what a picture of redemption right there. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, which is what that wonderful song was all about. Why? Because it's based in real history. Amen. So where did I come from? I came from God. God created all mankind so that he could have dominion over the earth and have fellowship with him. Why am I here? Because God loves you. That's why you're here. He created you that you would have a relationship with him. Where am I going to go when I die? That is a question that you have a choice in. Right? Where did we learn all this? In the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. Amen? So why do I believe the Bible? I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible. I believe that he created me. I believe he created me to have a relationship with him and to take dominion upon the earth. And if I put my faith and trust in him because I'm a sinner, because of the real events that happened in the history of the world, he will forgive me and he will take me to a place that's going to be like it was before Adam sinned in eternity. Woohoo! I'm not just saying that to be loud. I'm excited about that. I'm excited that Tom Jett is on the other side. I'm excited that my mom and dad are on the other side. No more sin, no more disease, no more death, no more suffering. They are with the creator God. Hallelujah. That is my faith. Where? From the word of God. His promise to me, thou shalt be saved, it says in John. Shalt, promise, if I do what? If I trust you. Man. Man. I remember going down in that submarine without the Lord. I didn't like that. I didn't. Here we go. Hulk going in. Maybe we won't come back up. It's a man-made object, amen? Okay. Then I became a believer. I could sit down there at my duty station. I could tap the depth gauge. My friend Mark Patachini, he'd be sitting there sweating like mad. He looked at me, you're not sweating. Mark, I'll be playing tag with the angels before the air bubbles ever hit the surface. I don't have to worry about it. I've been redeemed. You say it had that much of an impact on your life? Absolutely. I got the peace of God which passeth all understanding. It shall enrich your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I got it and I'm glad. I hope you have it. Have you driven on the roads out here lately? You need it. Amen. (laughs) I have that peace. But how did it all start? It started because I understood Jesus, who he was, his death, burial, resurrection. I understood that I have the word of God. And from the word of God, I've learned about my God and how it applies to me. Oh, praise God for a biblical worldview. Amen? And that's what you need to teach your children as an example. And you can do it. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. And he's never going to give you anything that you can't handle. Trust his word. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails and pain together until now. We see that in our world. It's groaning. 
What do I do? I did this. Confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead. Notice the bottom. Thou shalt be saved. That's my promise. Some of you need to go to work tomorrow and look at the person sitting next to you and ask yourself a question. If they were to die today, what would happen? They need to know this truth. God's put you right there to tell them because they have in their hearts, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going to go when I die? For with the heart, man believes on the righteousness, but with the mouth, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the Bible says. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's why we ask people to pray. I said, why don't you ask God? Some people I've been at the altar with and out on visitation with, they get the Holy Spirit is all over. I said, just tell him. Just sit there and tell him, and I'll listen. And they pour their hearts out. I had the, I had the extreme pleasure of going to the Philippines this year. And I preached a lot of messages in my life. And I got in a public high school over there, 550 kids. They said, go ahead and preach. And I preached for two hours. We gave the invitation. And over half of those kids stood up out loud, crying out to God to be saved. Amen. With a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Our God came to seek and save that which was lost. Part of our job as a church is to go. I shudder to think, Pastor, if I wouldn't have gone. God allowed me to see hundreds saved over there. That was the largest amount I've ever seen in my ministry ever. I mean, they stood up out loud for 10 minutes, crying out to God to be saved. People need the Lord. And he's still in the saving business. How do I know? Because we're still here. When it's all done, I think that's when we're going to get the call, we're going to hear the trumpet, and we'll be gone. But right now, we're still here. I hope that this message this morning has pricked your heart. I hope you understand the importance of this book. I had a great co-worker at the museum project at Answers in Genesis. One day, she said this to me. She said, it's his story. What does this book mean to you? Really? What does it mean to you? I hope I've encouraged you to try to get back in the word of God. To trust it. To believe him. Let him move mountains in your life. He'll do it. You've got to trust him. Maybe you're here this morning and you never have asked him to be your savior. You've just read his words on the screen. Would you ask him? Just ask him right where you're sitting. And he'll do it. He'll save you. Let's bow our heads.